Hi, I'm Deborah, and um, I'm working in the Green Street Garden at the moment. And gardening is something I really enjoy, and I often think of it in terms of um, just kind of changing the balance in nature in order to have more of what we want and less of what we don't want. And something that quite often comes to mind to me is um, a list, which is quite useful and very simple in Buddhism, called the Four Right Efforts. And now the first of those is basically to remove unskillful states. Any states of mind which make you ultimately unhappy are rather like weeds in the mind. And they basically, once we can identify them and recognize them for, for what they are, we need to um, remove them, which may be on, along the lines of something like just turning away from something that makes you angry. And we do this all the time in gardening. Then the second right effort is once you know about these unskillful states, to get to know the conditions which then prevent them from arising in the first place. And in gardening, where well, we can get quite skilled at, for example, having more of the plants that we do want there so that the weeds have no place to come. And we can see this very much in life. You know, the more we do the things which are skillful, which it leads then into the third right effort, which is developing skillful action. So, um, or skillful mindsets. So what a good gardener does is they basically plant the flowers, the plants that they want to have. Though unfortunately in gardening, quite often those take a bit more looking after than the weeds. The weeds are very hardy. And if we leave a garden like this one's been left <laughs> for the last three months, few months, because nobody's been here, then the hardy weeds tend to be the things that take over. So um, what a gardener needs to do then is basically maintain those skillful states, which leads us into the fourth right, eff right effort. Um, and we may need to water the plants, we need to keep the weeds away from them and basically um, do all of the, provide the conditions that mean that um, the skillful mind states can stay. So um, I'll just go through those again because they're, they're just a really lovely simple list. So there's the first right effort which is to eradicate or remove unskillful mind states. Then there's the second right effort, which is to prevent those unskillful mind states from even arising in the first place. Then the third right effort is to cultivate skillful states, those that ultimately make us happy and well. And the fourth right effort is to maintain those skillful states. So when you feel that you've reached maybe quite a nice, peaceful, generous state of mind that you recognize the conditions which will encourage that. Um, another thing that I always like to think about about gardening is to get things out by the root. So it's important to understand those um, habits which make us either um, happy or, or unhappy. So um, something I just like to think about when I'm gardening. Hello, my name is Sarah and I'm practicing meditation at the Samata Centre Green Street in Wales. When people visit here, they're given instructions to practice mindfulness and particularly mindfulness of the breath. So I've been walking around and going on walks around the grounds here, trying to be aware of my breath and to arouse mindfulness in my life. While I've been doing it, I remembered another list um, which actually can be very helpful to support mindfulness. We all try and cultivate mindfulness, but how do we keep it going? And this is the list of the four applications of clear comprehension. Now, if you've heard about mindfulness, you may have heard of this word sampajana, clear comprehension, or full awareness. This is something that is said to go with mindfulness and that you need to support it. And it's said to be of four kinds. So I'll just talk through 
those four because I've been finding them useful on walks and when I've been doing things here. The first kind is mindfulness of intent. Now, in the commentaries it refers to monks going on their arms round that they know they're going somewhere to receive food and they know when they're coming back. So how do we apply this in daily life? Now if you're getting a little bit older than like me <clears throat> you'll know the experience of uh, going into say something like the gardening shed we're doing a lot of gardening here and forgetting why you went there. That is the loss of the first kind of clear comprehension comprehension of intent. So if I go for a walk around here and I remember why I'm doing it, what am I doing it for, I have not only mindfulness but comprehension of intent. So if I know I'm going to the river and I'm aware of that, that's clear comprehension. And if I'm aware that I'm going somewhere deliberately just to get a little bit lost and just explore, that's also clear comprehension. I know why I'm doing that. I think some of us are uh, not in lovely surroundings going for walks, so it's something I need to remember in my daily life too. So if I go to the supermarket to say, get some chickpeas, I can be very mindful walking around the supermarket looking at all the things and seeing what's needed and picking it up and I can be mindful of my body and I can be mindful of my feelings but I can leave the supermarket and forget that I've come for chickpeas and that's because I need clear comprehension of intent so it's something that helps keep our mindfulness awake if you like it helps to support mindfulness the second kind of uh, clear comprehension is mindfulness of suitability. Is it the right time, place and setting to do something? Now, we're in a garden here. Uh, down there there's uh, all our orchards and various kinds of flowers are growing. And we enjoy planting things. But obviously we have to do it at a suitable time. We have to know when to plant something and know when not to. And, and of course the same applies to our mind. Sometimes it's suitable to do things and sometimes it isn't. And if you're mindful, you'll notice that sort of thing and perhaps might develop this kind of clear comprehension, which is mindfulness of suitability. Is it the right thing for now? There's no point in planning a 10 mile hike when you know you've got to be back in an hour. These very simple things, these are all involved in mindfulness and clear comprehension together, working for suitability, what is suitable at a particular time. The third kind of clear comprehension <clears throat> is very suitable for those who are practicing uh, a meditation and want to use it in their, their daily life. So here we practice mindfulness of the breath. So the third kind of clear comprehension is particularly suitable because it's mindful, mindfulness of your meditation object. And it's called a gochara. And a goes a, a cow or an animal, and a chara, it's where they wander, where they graze. So a meditation object is like your grazing area. Now there are a lot of grazing animals down there. There's some sheep over there. And if you talk to farmers, you find out that in a grazing area, nothing gets left out if it's a very good one. So even the dung, the hindrances, all the problems, they all get recycled and put to compost. This seemed a, a very apt simile for mindfulness of the breath. Because if you are mindful of your breath, you become aware of hindrances and problems of various kinds. Your mind can wander and get involved in things. But just being aware of the breath is like putting it to compost. Something will be found in it. It will be changed and become a nutriment, a nutriment for the mind, a kind of fuel, if you like. So that third kind of uh, clear comprehension is very helpful 
uh, when you visit a meditation center. But of course, it's very helpful too in daily life. When we go to, the, say, the supermarket or wait for the bus, just to be aware of the breath uh, in the background, it helps to compost our hindrances and our wandering thoughts and to encourage the good thoughts and the, the helpful states of mind to flourish. So I suppose it's both compost and fertilizer, if you like. And the fourth kind of clear comprehension is comprehension of no self, that it's not owned. I find this very important when I go on a walk around here and also when I admire a beautiful object is just to let it be exactly as it is. It isn't mine. And if I'm practicing breathing mindfulness, the breath isn't mine either. And I enjoy it much more if I just let it flow and if it is allowed to move naturally. It doesn't belong to me. And we tend to think of no self as things not belonging, but of course there's another side to no self. And that is the sense that one actually does belong and is part of other things too. So if you bro practice breathing mindfulness and you go for a walk in lovely landscape here, you can allow the attention, the mindfulness to go wide and the clear comprehension. And you can become aware of no self in the sense that things don't belong to you, but isn't it good that they don't? And that there are so many other things in the world that you can be aware of as well as yourself. Anyway, I hope that list was helpful and that it gives a little bit of uh, compost, if you like, for your own meditation.